Those lips are comically uneven. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Hello there, hi, welcome back. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like a fun combination to you, you're in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. Also, if you think the makeup part is weird, just, just close your eyes. Just watch with your ears. It's literally the same thing. <laughs> this story has a little bit of everything. It has some crew try me elements. It has some survival elements and it's got some hold on to your butts moments. So this is the story of Terry Joe Duperalt. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you would like to know any of the makeup products that I am using during this video, then too bad. I'm just kidding. Everything is linked down in the description box. Here we go. On November 13th, 1961, at 12.35 p.m., the Puerto Rico-bound oil tanker Gulf Lion was steaming along in the middle of the Northwest Providence Channel, Caribbean area. Up on the weather deck was a lookout scanning the horizon. Suddenly, he spotted what looked like a tiny boat. And it was. It was a wooden dinghy with um, like an inflatable raft tied to it. At first, he wasn't sure if there was anyone aboard either of these things, but then a man on the dinghy raised an arm, waving for help. Fuck me. As the tanker got closer, a man yelled out, My name is Julian Harvey. I am the master of the Bluebell. Julian Harvey had been hired by his friend, Arthur Duperalt, to pilot the Bluebell, which was a large sailing boat, like a yacht, for a family vacation from Fort Lauderdale to the Bahamas. And they had ran into some very bad weather. The main mast of the sailboat broke in half and the ship sank. All that was left of the ordeal was Harvey, the dinghy, whatever supplies he could put on it, and the dead body of a young child. Julian Harvey was taken to nearby Nassau, Bahamas for assistance and for questioning. So what happened? Let's rewind. Arthur Duperalt was a 41-year-old optometrist that was born and raised in Green Bay, Wisconsin. He had been in college when World War II broke out, so he'd left temporarily and joined the Navy. When he saw the ocean for the first time when they were headed out to Burma, he fell in love. Arthur had actually spent a lot of his life spending time on the water in Lake Michigan. The ocean just, you know, hits different. Now, Arthur wasn't super crazy about the Navy, but he did love the traveling part and especially sailing. He told himself that if he was lucky enough to get home and build a family of his own, he wanted to take them sailing. And he did. When he got back stateside, he met his wife, Jean, also born and raised in Green Bay. They'd settled down and built a life and they had children. And as a couple, they were very athletic, you know, always competing at golf tournaments or at skiing invitationals. By 1961, 40 year old Arthur worked hard as an optometrist and 38 year old Jean stayed home with the children. The oldest son, Brian, was a 14-year-old freshman at Preble High School. He took judo, he played baseball and golf. He was on the smaller side, so he was nicknamed Shrimp by his sisters. The youngest daughter was seven-year-old Renee. She was very feminine, she loved dresses and playing dress up, and she was always smiling. And then there was the middle daughter, 11-year-old Terry Jo. Terry Jo was in sixth grade at Weequeoc Elementary. She was an excellent student. She loved ice skating, horseback riding, and all sports except for golf. <laughs> so you get it. This was like a sporty family. Now, Arthur and Jean had been saving for a family sailing vacation since before they had children. They would often go sailing on Lake Michigan, but they'd never gone together as a family and definitely never out in the ocean. What they wanted to do was take an entire year and sail around the world as a family. But first, they needed to see if the kids could handle life on a boat. They had initial concerns about the children feeling cooped up or, you know, being on the water for too long. Very valid concerns. 
but they spoke to all of the children's teachers. They were clear to take them out for the fall semester and at least, you know, to start with to see if they could handle it. And then they would go from there. Both Arthur and Jean planned to help teach the kids their school lessons. Also, although this was initially Arthur's dream, it had then become like a family dream. The parents really wanted the children to be happy. So making the final decision to actually go on this family sailing adventure around the world, it was gonna be a group choice. And if anybody didn't wanna go, they weren't gonna do it. So to test the waters, See what I did there? They were planning a short trip, like a, a shakedown, if you will. We're using all the right nautical terms today, scallywags. Avoid that. From Fort Lauderdale, Florida, down to the Bahamas and back again. Just a little over a week on the boat. And in the summer of 1961, Arthur found somebody to take over his optometry business for six months. And if all went well, it might be for a year. In the beginning of November, the family packed up two station wagons. One of them was pulling a large hardtop camper and they were gonna use that for everybody to sleep in instead of having to like get hotels, you know? On Wednesday, November 8th, they found the yacht they had rented for the trip. It was called the Bluebell. The Bluebell was a 60 foot, two masted sailing catch. The masts, they're the big posts that stick up that you attach the sails to. What's the difference between a sailboat and a yacht? I don't know, I don't know. Size, I think anything over 40 feet you can call a yacht, but like whatever. Okay, so although Arthur had done a ton of research and he was pretty experienced himself as a sailor, he wanted to play it safe out in the ocean until he felt more confident. So he hired a skipper. The guy was pretty well known. He was a acquaintance of his. He was a 44 year old Air Force veteran named Julian Harvey. And Julian's wife, 34-year-old Danae, was going to join the voyage to serve as the cook. I think she was a former airline stewardess, maybe? Something like that. So the five Duperalt family members and the Harvey Two set sail together that Wednesday. By 5 p.m., they made it to Bimini, which is a small island in the Bahamas, the one that's like kind of closest to the United States, off the coast of Florida. Arthur went ashore to the customs office to show their passports and check in. And then once they did that, they'd be clear to, you know, go to any of the islands in the Bahamas. But since it was after five o'clock, the office was closed closed. No worries though, you know, they would just stay on the ship for the night and they did. The next morning they got up and they sailed further east towards the bigger islands and they did some snorkeling offshore and on Friday they finally made it to Sandy Point and did their whole check-in. The village commissioner, Roderick Pinder, remembered meeting with Arthur and Jean. Arthur told him that he loved the feel of the islands. He also spoke about the trip saying that this has been a once-in-a-lifetime vacation and we have thoroughly enjoyed it and we're gonna come back and use Sandy Point as our winter headquarters. Then he talked to Commissioner Pinder about the possibility of them building a vacation home there and Pinder said that when speaking about the time that he was spending with his children, Arthur was just so happy. He had tears in his eyes. He said that this was literally his life's dream. In Sandy Point, they found what they had always been looking for and they stayed. They alternated between spending time on the beach and snorkeling offshore and then meeting and spending time with the locals. During their stay, Julian met up with a man that he'd worked with on another boat called Napoleon Roberts. He invited him to dinner. Napoleon would later say that the vibes that night were great. You know, everybody was relaxed and getting along and they were just having a good time. The Duperalts weren't really big drinkers, but the Harveys were definitely enjoying some adult beverages. Did someone say a beer for a Well, because Sunday was their last day to be in Sandy Point, the Duperalts bought souvenirs out in town and some locally made art. Danae Harvey, Julian's wife, told Commissioner Pinder that the Duperalts had already booked her and Julian for a return trip later in the year and she was so excited. She said that they were going to be back before Christmas and she told his wife that she'd be happy to bring back American clothes and magazines. That day on the beach, Arthur met a young boy named Jimmy Wells and they began talking about fishing and sharks. Arthur said that it seemed like a very large shark had been kind of tailing them around as they sailed the area and they considered shooting it but decided not to because it didn't make sense to kill something if they weren't going to eat it. Which I agree, Arthur. 
So Arthur invited Jimmy to join them for dinner on the boat that night, and Jimmy would also later say that it was just a really lovely time. Everyone was in good spirits, getting along really well, just very friendly, relaxed vibes, and Danae made a very delicious meal of chicken cacciatore. So after dinner and after their new friend Jimmy left for the evening, Julian decided that they were going to go ahead and set sail that night. Well, because of this, there was some discussion discussion about maybe sleeping upstairs on the weather deck so that they could watch the stars in the sky. So they did. It was a beautiful evening out in the salty air. Well, at about 9 p.m., little Terry Jo, I guess, was not feeling it, over it. <laughs> so she decided to go down below, change into her PJs, and then just go to sleep in her cabin. Sometime later in the night, Terry Jo woke up to the sound of her brother screaming, help, daddy, help. And then she heard loud thumping or footsteps, you know, like clunking around. So she snuck out of her cabin as quietly as she could and crept up the stairs and found her mother and brother lying on the floor of the galley covered in blood. She knew instantly that they were dead. Her brother was in his pajamas, but her mom was still wearing her day clothes, which means that at some point her brother did retire to the bunk room to go to bed, but her mom did not. So Terry Jo kept kind of looking around trying to find the rest of her family, but instead she saw the skipper, Julian. He was carrying some kind of bucket or can, and then he pushed her and yelled at her to go back down below. Terrified, that's exactly what she did. Well, within minutes, some like oily smelling water started bubbling into her room. The ship is taking on water at this point. Then she saw a figure appear in her doorway. It was Julian and it looked like he was holding a rifle. He didn't say anything to her. He just stared at her and then he left. What is happening? Well, 11 year old Terry is confused and scared, but the water is like rising in her cabin and she knows she can't just sit there and do nothing. So she waded out of the cabin, waist high water out to the steps to go up to the weather deck. She's looking for Danae, her dad, her little sister, but she couldn't find anyone. But she did see Julian running around on the deck back and forth looking very busy. She called out, is the ship sinking? And Julian said, yes. Hold this. He handed her a line, like a rope, to hold, but she was in like such shock that it just slipped right out of her hand. Well, that line was attached to the lifeboat, like the dinghy, and that was their only way to get off of that sinking ship safely, which was now drifting away. So Julian jumped into the water after it. Thanks for fucking nothing, Captain Think For Yourselfer. So this ship captain has just now abandoned this 11 year old girl to fend for herself on a sinking ship. And Terry Jo just doesn't understand what, what the hell happened. I mean, aside from all this water coming on the ship, nothing else was wrong with it. The masts were fine. The sails were fine. There was no smoke. There was no n nothing but it was sinking for sure. Well, even in the midst of all this craziness and chaos, Terry Jo had enough sense to recall that she remembered seeing a cork float lashed to the side of the main cabin, which was now barely above water. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What is a cork float? So history time. Okay, so what she remembered seeing that day is something very similar to what we would call a life ring, life preserver, life buoy ring, a kisby ring, a peri buoy. You know what I'm talking about, this thing. Avoid them. These were originally made out of cork because cork is very buoyant or, you know, floaty. But this is 1961. It wasn't necessarily as standardized as they are in modern times. The one that Terry grabbed was kind of oblong shaped, about two by five feet long. It had a little net in it, you know, pretty much just big enough for you to sit in. And it seems to me like this thing was probably meant more to be like decorative because it wasn't very strong. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so Terry Jo runs over, unties the cork float, and as the yacht is sinking from underneath her feet, she scrambles herself up on top of it. For a quick second, Terry and the float were actually pulled down with the bluebell as it sank because the lines got all tangled up, but the line freed itself and she popped back up. Now 
She's alone. The ship's gone. It's dark. She's afraid that Julian might find her, you know, in the quietness and try to hurt her. So like she's staying perfectly still and silent. She's wondering where her family is. She's freezing. She's wet. She's terrified. Can you imagine it? Hours go by. The sun comes up. She has no shelter from the sun. So she's like lying there crisping up like bacon. No fresh water, no food. Oh, and by the way, the float, the decorative float, it's starting to fall apart. The fish were like nipping at her legs and feet and it got so bad that they started to bleed. You guys know what lives in the ocean. Oh. She floated like that for four days. Four days. At one point, she saw a small plane flying overhead, pretty low, and she was waving. They didn't see her. The Gulf Stream pushed her north and then, you know, east. She's just floating in the middle of nowhere. Burnt, dehydrated, starving, in organ failure, hallucinating, and on the brink of death. But then on the morning of the fourth day, a Greek freighter called the Captain Theo was steaming along the Providence Channel near the Bahamas when a lookout saw something strange in the water. He was watching the white caps of the waves breaking, but one little speck looked different. And then suddenly the white speck, an arm shot up and was waving. He realized it was a person. So the crew of the ship quickly went into action. They launched a dinghy and they were able to go out to Terry Joe, who, by the way, was being circled by sharks. Boy, now I know a shark. Not a mindless eating machine. She had been sitting in the same position for so long that she was like totally frozen, stiff, couldn't move her arms or legs. She was able to identify herself as Terry Joe Duperalt, but then she just kind of gave out and fell into like a semi coma. She was extremely sunburnt. Her lips were dry and cracked. Her organs were jacked. She was extremely dehydrated, but she was gonna make it. She was airlifted to an intensive care unit hospital in Miami to receive treatment and her condition significantly improved over the coming days. She was in full shock when she got here. What's her condition? Mm -hmm. Serious, but I think she'll be all right. I think she'll live. Is there any indication that there might be somebody else out there? Well, there's always possibility wherever there's hope, and we certainly have hope the search is going to continue. But it would be a solid week before she had her bearings enough to be able to give her official account of what happened that night on the Bluebell. So meanwhile, back to the very beginning of the story, Julian had been rescued three days before they found Terry Joe, And he was busy telling his side of the story to officials in Nassau, and then later to the Coast Guard officials in Miami. Julian Harvey told officials that after they set sail that night from Sandy Point, they encountered this terrible squall out on the water, came out of nowhere. They caught a rogue wave over the beam of the ship, meaning that a wave essentially hit the side of the boat straight on, and it pushed the bluebell over, which caused the mast to break in half. Remember, there's two masts on this thing. It caused the main mast to break and slam straight down into the deck, punching a giant hole into the hull. He said that damage was so extensive that all of the sails and rigging were like a tangled mess all over the deck. Also, all of the fuel lines down in the engine room had been punctured and pretty soon the entire ship was engulfed in flames. He was able to empty two fire extinguishers at the fire, but it was useless because the boat was sinking and most everyone was in the cockpit up on the weather deck. That collapse happened right kind of on top of them. So his thought was to get in the dinghy, you know, get that away from the ship and then he would come back and scoop everybody up out of the water. He spotted in the distance little Terry Joe floating away face down looking very drowned. He scooped up little Renee from the water. She was unconscious, but it wasn't clear whether she was dead or not. He said repeatedly that there was just nothing he could do and he felt terrible. You know, this entire family was lost, not to mention his own wife. He was just defeated, but strangely calm. The Coast Guard was squinting. You caught a rogue wave to the beam of the ship, but then the mast fell straight down into the deck, like vertical? Wouldn't it have, you know, fallen over? Also, he had time to grab and empty two fire extinguishers, but he didn't have time to like get off a mayday call. He also could not tell them at all the general location of where this occurred. I mean, okay. Sure, Jan. 
Well, they wrapped up the interview and they said that they would meet again the next day to finish up some paperwork things. When Julian returned the next day, he seemed in pretty good spirits. Little Renee's autopsy report had come back and her cause of death was confirmed to have been drowning. I mean, it didn't clear him completely, but at least it matched. Of course, when he was speaking about his wife, he tried to summon some tears and emotion, but you know, the dry kind. But really what the Coast Guard wanted to know about was this squall. Well, the Coast Guard monitors the state of the ocean and the weather and things in their area of responsibility, and they knew for a fact that there was no weather in that area. Then they got the call about Terry Joe being found alive. He said he saw her floating away in her life vest, dead. <laughs> Terry at this point wasn't ready to speak because she was still in the ICU, but it was looking good. So the investigators told Julian this great news, you know, she was expected to make a full recovery. And then they carefully watched his response. All the color drained out of his face and he said, just wonderful. Then he asked if he could be excused for the rest of the day. He said he was tired and he just really wanted to spend time with his wife's family. What he really did was go check into the Sandman Hotel under um, an assumed name, John Monroe. While he was there, he wrote a two page letter to a friend, James Boozer saying, quote, I'm a nervous wreck and I just can't continue. I'm going out. I guess I either don't like life or I don't know what to do with it. Also in the letter, he made arrangements for his own son to be adopted and he wanted his own burial to be at sea. And isn't it ironic? Then the 44 year old Julian Harvey used a razor to cut his own throat, his wrists and legs. A few days after Julian's self-imposed death, Terry Jo recovered enough to finally give her official statement to officials. Official statement to officials. Well, she told the Coast Guard the story that I already told you and she told it with consistency more than two or three times. They believed her. They took that and then they started to dig into Julian Harvey. The first thing they found is probably the strongest motive for the murders. Julian had recently taken out a double indemnity life insurance policy on his new wife, Danae, two months before the murders. The total payout was $20,000, but if she died in a freak accident, like a sailboating accident, it would be doubled to 40,000. In today money, that's $410,000. Okay. When they looked just a little bit closer, they saw a pattern of either the worst luck in the world or some seriously shady shit. So Danae was Julian's sixth wife and one of his former wives had passed away from a terrible car accident where he was the driver. He accidentally drove a car off of a bridge and the wife and mother died in the accident. The investigation into the accident showed that the only way that a person would have gotten out of this wreck, but the others didn't, is if they knew it was gonna happen. But couldn't really prove that. Then there were the two, that's four, two previous boating accidents where the boats sank and he had to be rescued. Experienced skipper. Hmm? What? Each of those incidents was suspicious, but since nothing could be proven, he did collect those hefty insurance payments. Julian Harvey had always planned to kill his wife, Danae, for that insurance money. And he only killed the Duperalt family to make the story more believable. There's also a theory that he actually did attack Danae that night, but he was interrupted by Arthur Duperalt, which set into motion this chain of events that left everyone dead except for Terry Joe. If Terry Joe had died that night, nobody would have known what Julian Harvey did and he probably would have killed again. After her rescue, Terry Jo Duperalt received support from all over the world and she did make a full recovery. The case also inspired the Coast Guard to direct a change in boating regulations that required all life rings and life rafts to be brightly colored international orange, like this. Terry Jo was raised in Wisconsin by her aunt and uncle with her three cousins. She changed the spelling of her name to leave behind the little Terry Jo stigma. And despite finding love, getting married, and having six kids of her own, she spent most of her adulthood searching for her father. Since his body was never recovered, she always hoped that it would turn up one day. It wasn't until she was like 35 that she was able to let all of that go. Terry Jo explored different career paths until she found one that really fit 
She actually worked as a water management specialist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, funny enough. In September of 1988, Oprah Winfrey actually arranged for her to be reunited with that freighter captain who saved her life. Terry Jo never actually spoke openly or publicly about what happened to her that night on the Bluebell until 2010 when she wrote a book about it called Alone, Orphaned in the Ocean. She said, quote, I always believed I was saved for a reason. If one person heals from a life tragedy, my journey will have been worth it. And that is the incredible survival story of Terry Jo Duperant. That was a doozy. That was a doozy. Like these overlined lips. <laughs> Again, if you want to see any of the makeup that I used in today's video, just look down in the description box. Everything is linked. And if something is no longer available because it's incredibly old and expired, I will link something similar. <laughs> if you have a crew trime case that you would like to recommend to me, also down in the description box is a link to a Google doc where you can fill in all of the dirty details. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on all of the other socials as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. The insurance policies or claims who was an, an hefty life and in, not life insurance health healthy both <laughs> get it together Denine Denis Denay Denay Wisconsin Sandy Point fucking fuck hello 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 can you hear me